machine stops by Ian Forster, read by M.J. Hahn, featuring Mike Bennett and Sally Clausen. Part 3, The Homeless. During the years that followed Kuno's escapade, two important developments took place in the machine. On the surface, they were revolutionary, but in either case, men's minds had been prepared beforehand, and they did but express tendencies that were latent already. The first of these was the abolition of the respirator. Advanced thinkers, like Vashti, had always felt it foolish to visit the surface of the Earth. Airships might be necessary, but what was the good of going out for mere curiosity and crawling along for a mile or two in a terrestrial motor? The habit was vulgar, and perhaps faintly improper. It was unproductive of ideas and had no connection with the habits that really mattered. So respirators were abolished, and with them, of course, the terrestrial motors. And except for a few lecturers who complained that they were debarred access to their subject matter, the development was accepted quietly. Those who still wanted to know what the Earth was like had, after all, only to listen to some gramophone or to look into some cinematophote. And even the lecturers acquiesced when they found out that a lecture on the sea was nonetheless stimulating when compiled out of other lectures that had already been delivered on the same subject. Beware of first-hand ideas, exclaimed one of the most advanced of them. First-hand ideas do not really exist. They are but the physical impressions produced by live and fear. And on this gross foundation, who could erect a philosophy? Let your ideas be second-hand, and if possible, tenth-hand, for then they will be far removed from that disturbing element, direct observation. Do not learn anything about the subject of mine, the French Revolution. Learn instead what I think of any charmer, thought Horizon, thought Gooch, thought Ho Young, thought Chibo Singh, thought Lascadio Hearn, thought Carlyle, thought Mirabeau, said about the French Revolution. Through the medium of these ten great minds, the blood that was shed in Paris, and the windows that were broken at Versailles, will be clarified to an idea which you may employ most profitably in your daily lives. But be sure that the intermediates are many and varied, for in history, one authority exists to counteract another. Horizon must counteract the skepticism of Ho Young and Enishamo. I must myself counteract the impetuosity of Gooch. You who listen to me are in better position to judge about the French Revolution than I am. Your descendants will be even in a better position than you, for they will learn what you think I think. And yet another intermediary will be added to the chain. And in time, there will come a generation that had got beyond facts, beyond impressions, a generation absolutely colorless, a generation seraphically free from the taint of personality, which will see the French Revolution not as it happened, nor as they would have liked it to have happened, but as it would have happened had it taken place during the days of the machine. Tremendous applause greeted this lecture which did but voice a feeling already latent in the minds of men, a feeling that terrestrial facts must be ignored and that the abolition of respirators was a positive gain. It was even suggested that airships should be abolished too. This was not done because airships had somehow worked themselves into the machine system, but year by year they were used less and mentioned less by thoughtful men. The second great development was the reestablishment of religion. This, too, had been voiced in a celebrated lecture. No one could mistake the reverent tone for which their peroration had concluded. It awakened a responsive echo in the heart of each. Those who had long worshipped silently now began to talk. They described the strange feeling of peace that came over them when they handled the book of the machine, the pleasure that it was to repeat certain numerals out of it, however little meaning those numbers conveyed to the outward ear, the ecstasy of touching a button however unimportant, or of ringing a bell, however superfluously. The machine feeds us, clothes us, and houses us. Through it we speak to one another, and through it we see one another. 
In it, we have our being. The machine is the friend of ideas and the enemy of superstition. The machine is omnipotent, eternal. Blast is the machine. And before long, this allocution was printed on the first page of the book, and in subsequent editions, the ritual swelled into a complicated system of praise and prayer. The word religion was sedulously avoided, and in theory, the machine was still the creation and the implement of man, but in practice, all save a few retrogrades worshipped it as divine. Nor was it worshipped in unity. One believer would be chiefly impressed by the blue optic plates through which he saw other believers, another by the mending apparatus which sinful Kuno had compared to worms, another by the lifts, another by the book, and each would pray to this or to that and ask it to intercede for him with the machine as a whole. Persecution? That was also present. It did not break out for reasons that will be set forward shortly, but it was latent, and all who did not accept the minimum known as undenominational mechanism lived in danger of homelessness, which means death as we know. To attribute these two great developments to the Central Committee is to take a very narrow view of civilization. The Central Committee announced the developments, it is true, but they were no more the cause of them than were the kings of the imperialistic period the cause of war. Rather did they yield to some invincible pressure, which came no one knew whither, and which, when gratified, was succeeded by some new pressure equally invincible. To such a state of affairs it is convenient to give the name of progress. No one confessed the machine was out of hand. Year by year it was served with increased efficiency and decreased intelligence. The better a man knew his own duties upon it, the less he understood the duties of his neighbor, and in all the world there was no one who understood the monster as a whole. Those master brains had perished. They had left full directions, it is true, and their successors had each of them mastered a portion of those directions, but humanity, in its desire for comfort, had overreached itself. It had exploited the riches of nature too far. Quietly and complacently it was sinking into decadence, and progress had come to mean the progress of the machine. As for Vashti, her life went peacefully forward until the final disaster. She made her room dark and slept. She awoke and made the room light. She lectured and attended lectures. She exchanged ideas with her innumerable friends and believed she was growing more spiritual. At times a friend was granted euthanasia and left his or her room for the homelessness that is beyond all human conception. Vashti did not much mind. After an unsuccessful lecture, she would sometimes ask for euthanasia herself, but the death rate was not permitted to exceed the birth rate and the machine had hitherto refused her. The troubles began quietly, long before she was conscious of them. One day, she was astonished at receiving a message from her son. They never communicated, having nothing in common, and she had only heard indirectly that he was still alive and had been transferred from the northern hemisphere where he had behaved so mischievously to the southern, indeed, to a room not too far from her own. Does he want me to visit him? Never again, never. And I do not have the time. No, it was madness of another kind. He refused to visualize his face upon the blue plate, and speaking out of the darkness, with solemnity said, The machine stops. What did you say? The machine is stopping. I know it. I know the signs. <laughs> she burst into a peal of laughter. He heard her and was angry, and they spoke no more. Can you imagine anything more absurd? A man who was my son believes the machine is stopping. It would be impious if it were not mad. The machine is stopping? What does that mean? The phrase conveys nothing to me. Nor to me. He does not refer, I suppose, to the trouble that has been lately with the music. Oh, no, of course not. Let us talk about the music. Have you complained to the authorities? Yes. And they say it wants mending, and referred me to the committee of the mending apparatus. I complained of those curious gasping sounds that disfigure the symphonies of the Brisbane school. They sound like someone in pain. The committee of the mending apparatus say that it shall be remedied shortly. Obscurely worried, she resumed her life. 
For one thing, the defect in the music irritated her. For another thing, she could not forget Kuno's speech. If he had known that the music was out of repair, he could not know it, for he detested music. If he had known that it was wrong, the machine stops was exactly the venomous sort of remark he would have made. Of course, he had made it at a venture, but the coincidence annoyed her, and she spoke with some petulance to the committee of the mending apparatus. They replied, as before, that the defect would be set right shortly. Shortly? At once? Why should I be worried by imperfect music? Things are always put right at once. If you do not mend it at once, I shall complain to the Central Committee. No personal complaints are received by the Central Committee. Through whom am I to make my complaint, then? Through us. Well, I complain, then. Your complaint shall be forwarded in its turn. Have others complained? This question is unmechanical. Answer refused. Answer refused. Answer refused. Answer refused. Answer refused. Answer refused. It is too bad. There never was such an unfortunate woman as myself. I can never be sure of my music now. It gets worse and worse each time I summon it. What is it? I do not know whether it is inside my head or inside the wall. Complain in either case. I have complained, and my complaint will be forwarded in its turn to the Central Committee. Time passed, and they resented the defects no longer. The defects had not been remedied, but the human tissues on that latter day had become so subservient that they readily adapted themselves to every caprice of the machine. The sigh at the crises of the Brisbane Symphony no longer irritated Vashti. She accepted it as part of the melody. The jarring noise, whether in her head or in the wall, was no longer resented by her friend. And so with the moldy artificial fruit, so with the bath water that began to stink. So with the defective rhymes that the poetry machine had taken to emit, all were bitterly complained of at first, and then acquiesced in and forgotten. Things went from bad to worse, unchallenged. It was otherwise with the failure of the sleeping apparatus. That was a more serious stoppage. There came a day when over the whole world, in Sumatra, in Wessex, in the innumerable cities of Corland and Brazil, the beds, when summoned by their tired owners, failed to appear. It may seem a ludicrous matter, but from it we may date the collapse of humanity. The committee responsible for the failure was assailed by complainants, whom it referred, as usual, to the committee of the mending apparatus, who in its turn assured them that their complaints would be forwarded to the central committee. But discontent grew, for mankind was not yet sufficiently adaptable to do without sleeping. Someone is meddling with the machine. Someone is trying to make himself king, to reintroduce the personal element. Who is that man with homelessness? To the rescue. Avenge the machine. Avenge the machine. War. Kill the man. But the committee of the mending apparatus now came forward and allayed the panic with well-chosen words. It confessed that the mending apparatus was itself in need of repair. The effect of this frank confession was admirable. Of course, said a famous lecturer, he of the French Revolution, who gilded each new decay with splendor. Of course, we shall not press our complaints now. The mending apparatus has treated us so well in the past that we all sympathize with it and will wait patiently for its recovery. In its own good time, it will resume its duties. Meanwhile, let us do without our beds, our tabloids, our other little ones. Such, I feel sure, would be the wish of the machine. Thousands of miles away, his audience applauded. The machine still linked them. Under the seas, beneath the roots of the mountains, ran the wires through which they saw and heard, the enormous eyes and ears that were their heritage, and the hum of many workings clothed their thoughts in one garment of subserviency. Only the old and sick remained ungrateful, for it was rumored that euthanasia too was out of order, and that pain had reappeared among men. It became difficult to read. A blight entered the atmosphere and dulled its luminosity. At times Vashti could scarcely see across her room. The air too was foul. Loud were the complaints, impotent the remedies, heroic the tone of the lecturer as he cried, Courage! Courage! 
What matters so long as the machine goes on? To it, the darkness and the light are one. And though things improved again after a time, the old brilliancy was never recaptured, and humanity never recovered from its entrance into twilight. There was an hysterical talk of measures, of provisional dictatorship, and the inhabitants of Sumatra were asked to familiarize themselves with the workings of the central power station, the said power station being situated in France. But for the most part, panic reigned, and men spent their strength praying to their books, tangible proofs of the machine's omnipotence. There were gradations of terror. At times came rumors of hope. The mending apparatus was almost mended. The enemies of the machine had been got under. New nerve centers were evolving, which would do the work even more magnificently than before. But there came a day when, without the slightest warning, without any previous hint of feebleness, the entire communication system broke down all over the world, and the world as they understood it ended. Vashti was lecturing at the time, and her earlier remarks had been punctuated with applause. As she proceeded, the audience became silent, and at the conclusion there was no sound. Somewhat displeased, she called to a friend who was a specialist in sympathy. No sound. Doubtless the friend was sleeping, and so with the next friend whom she tried to summon, and so with the next until she remembered Kuno's cryptic remark. The machine stops. The phrase still conveyed nothing. If eternity was stopping, it would of course be set going shortly. For example, there was still a little light and air. The atmosphere had improved a few hours previously. There was still the book, and while there was the book, there was security. Then she broke down, for with the cessation of activity came an unexpected terror Silence. She had never known silence, and the coming of it nearly killed her. It did kill many thousands of people outright. Ever since her birth, she had been surrounded by the steady hum. It was to the ear what artificial air was to the lungs, and agonizing pains shot across her head. And scarcely knowing what she did, she stumbled forward and pressed the unfamiliar button, the one that opened the door to her cell. Now, the door of the cell worked on a simple hinge of its own. It was not connected to the central power station dying far away in France. It opened, rousing immoderate hopes in Vashti, for she thought that the machine had been mended. It opened, and she saw the dim tunnel that curved far away towards freedom. One look, and then she shrank back, for the tunnel was full of people. She was almost the last in that city to have taken alarm. People at any time repelled her, and these were nightmares from her worst dreams. People were crawling about. People were screaming, whimpering, gasping for breath, touching each other, vanishing in the dark, and ever anon being pushed off of the platform onto the live rail. Some were fighting round the electric bells, trying to summon trains which could not be summoned. Others were yelling for euthanasia, or for respirators, or blaspheming the machine. Others stood at the doors of their cells, fearing, like herself, either to stop in them or to leave them, and behind all the uproar was silence, the silence which was the voice of the earth and of the generations who have gone. No, it was worse than solitude. She closed the door again and sat down to wait for the end. The disintegration went on, accompanied by horrible cracks and rumbling. The valves that restrained the medical apparatus must have weakened, for it ruptured and hung hideously from the ceiling. The floor heaved and fell and flung her from the chair. A tube oozed towards her, serpent fashion, and at last the final horror approached. Light began to ebb, and she knew that civilization's long day was closing. She whirled around, praying to be saved from this, at any rate kissing the book, pressing button after button. The uproar outside was increasing, and even penetrated the wall. Slowly, the brilliancy of her cell dimmed. The reflections faded from the metal switches. Now she could not see the reading stand, now not the book, though she held it in her hand. Light followed the flight of sound, air was following light, and the original void returned to the cavern from which it has so long been excluded. Vashti continued to whirl like the devotees of an earlier religion, screaming, praying, striking at the buttons with bleeding hands. 
It was thus that she opened her prison and escaped. Escaped in the spirit, at least, so it seems to me, ere my meditation closes. That she escapes in the body, I cannot perceive that. She struck, by chance, the switch that released the door, and the rush of foul air on her skin. The loud, throbbing whispers in her ears told her that she was facing the tunnel again, and that tremendous platform on which she had seen men fighting. They were not fighting now. Only the whispers remained, and the little whimpering groans. They were dying by hundreds out in the dark. She burst into tears. Tears answered her. They wept for humanity, those two, not for themselves. They could not bear that this should be the end. Ere silence was completed, their hearts were opened, and they knew what had been important on the earth. Man, the flower of all flesh, the noblest of all creatures visible. Man, who had once made God in his image, and had mirrored his strength on the constellations. Beautiful, naked man was dying, strangled in the garments that he had woven. Century after century he had toiled, and here was his reward. Truly, the garment had seemed heavenly at first, shot with colors of culture, sewn with the threads of self-denial, and heavenly it had been so long as man could shed it at will and live by the essence that is his soul, and the essence equally divine that is his body. The sin against the body, it was for this that they wept in chief. The centuries of wrong against the muscles and the nerves, and those five portals by which we can alone apprehend, glossing it over with talk of evolution until the body was white pap, the home of ideas as colorless last sloshy stirrings of a spirit that had grasped at the stars. Where are you? His voice in the darkness answered. Here. Is there any hope, Kuno? None for us. Where are you? She crawled over the bodies of the dead. His blood spurted over her hands. Quicker! I am dying. But we touch. We talk. Not through the machine. He kissed her. We have come back to our own. We die. But we have recaptured life, as it was in Wessex when Aelfred overthrew the Danes. We know what they know outside. They who dwelt in the cloud that is the color of a pearl. Akuno, is it true? Are there still men on the surface of the earth? Is this tunnel, this poison darkness, really not the end? I have seen them, spoken to them, loved them. They are hiding in the mist and the ferns until our civilization stops. Today they are homeless. Tomorrow. Tomorrow? Some fool will start the machine again. Tomorrow. Never. Never. Humanity has learned its lesson. As he spoke, the whole city was broken like a honeycomb. An airship had sailed in through a vomitory into a ruined wharf. It crashed downwards, exploding as it went, rending gallery after gallery with its wings of steel. For a moment they saw the nations of the dead, and before they joined them, scraps of the untainted sky. This concludes our story in Part 3, The Homeless. Special thanks go to guest voices, Mike Bennett as Kuno and Sally Clausen as Vashti. Music on the program provided by freesound.org. The theme song, Optimist, by Zoe Keating. So, listeners, now that our story is done, perhaps it's a good time to consider switching off our blue plates and cinematophotes and maybe explore the outer air. What do you think, hmm? So, until next time, goodbye for now, and thanks for listening. <laughs>